who followed you as they created these United States. Bless our meeting tonight. Guide our words and actions that they may be pleasing to you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, have a seat, everyone. You all have programs on your tables and, and agendas for the evening, but we're going to make a change all that. So... <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what plans are for? Um, I would like to start by welcoming all of our guests tonight. We have quite a few new members, new visitors, um, and we want to move on quickly so we can get to our uh, our speakers. But we do want to do a special welcome to everyone who is here for the first time this evening and to our guests. Um, I would like to start now by... Um, I have my notes. Introducing a special man to South Florida conservative. Um, to those of you who know, who know him, then what I am about to say will be no surprise. This gentleman lives by the principles that he teaches, and that's why this is no surprise to you. Um, I would like to present to you a gentleman who is a teacher, a leader, a motivational and inspirational teacher. Speaker, speaker, speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce this gentleman who is a constitutional student, as well as a good friend to many here at South Florida Conservative around the South Florida area. I'd like to introduce to you the founder of South Florida Conservative, Mr. Marcos Senna. Who was that guy she was speaking about anyway? Wow, that's terrific. Whoever that guy is, wow, I'd like to meet him. Folks, welcome tonight. We have a packed slate of wonderful guests who are going to be here for you. Hey, first, before we get really started, I'd like to just take a second. Everyone sitting where you are, let's just take a moment to uh, be quiet for just one moment and reflect on the victims of that atrocious act of war that was known as 9-11. Let's have just a moment of silence for all who lost their lives that day and for all who were left without their family members. Thank you. Folks, I'm gonna, not going to bore you with my rankings and my ratings this month, so get ready for next month, because that means I'm going to be doing double the amount next month. So anyway, tonight I'd like to bring up here an outstanding gentleman. He is the CFO of the state of Florida. His credentials are impeccable, as is his reputation, his education, and his long list of achievements. In fact, if you don't know the CFO of the state of Florida, Mr. Jeff Atwater, you're going to be very happy you're here tonight. And once you do know about him, you're only going to want to know more. This is a man that in our humble opinion, you should keep your sights on because CFO, wow, that's a fine, fine achievement and great stature, but I wouldn't be surprised sometime to see this gentleman to hire places and to hire positions because he's just that kind of person. Folks, give a big hand and a warm South Florida conservative welcome. Marcus, thank you. It's very kind. Um, I really appreciate you letting me be with you this evening. And, and I think if I could maybe just share a few comments, and then would it be okay to take questions? I don't want to Certainly. run. I don't want to take your agenda time. Certainly, that's fine. But I think that would be pretty valuable, and I would want you to uh, to have the opportunity to ask uh, questions of me. 
about how our, how our state is doing or any other observations that, uh, that we may share together. So uh, first, thank you for the opportunity again. Good to be with you. I would like to be sure that if we haven't met uh, my assistant here uh, in Dade County that is a right arm to me, Diana Artiga. Uh, Diana, you want to just give away. She is right here. Uh, with us every day here in our community and is uh, uh, one trying to keep an eye on me being present and available and responsive as well to everybody. Uh, then I'd also I'd like to say hello to our first day representative. I'm going to be with you this evening. And Anna, good to see you again. Keeping an, eye, speaking, keeping an eye on, keeping an eye on our Congressman David Rivera. Uh, so good to be with you all again. Let me just uh, share a couple things here. We are at a, we are at a real, and this doesn't come as any surprise because I think we share a common concern here. We are at a real uh, fork in the road uh, for the country. Uh, and I want to just lay these two things side by side. Uh, Florida has accepted one particular path uh, and, and always tremendous room for improvement. And I would like to be able to give credit to those who have been serving you. And, uh, and then our, our federal government has chosen a very different path at this moment. And, and here's what I would share with you. Florida, uh, fifth largest unemployment rate in the country, all right? So 10.7%. We have 23% uh, of all residential mortgages given that kind of unemployment are either past due or in foreclosure. So almost one out of every four homes. So the prop, so when that many homes are in foreclosure, what is happening to the value of the property? Well. For a single family trading homes here in Florida five years ago, the average selling price between a buyer and a seller was $258,000. Now, five years later, it's $131,000. So when that happens, then you know what the next point would be is that 46% of all of our mortgages in Florida are underwater compared to the present value. Now, how could it possibly then be that the state that's hurt worse by the worst financial meltdown since our Great Depression uh, and hurt worse by a housing bubble could then the very same month receive from S&P's credit rating agency an upgrade on the outlook of our future. Uh, first off, I'd say that's pretty extraordinary given the situation. But at the very same month, our country is being downgraded. So there's only 12 states in the Union that have a AAA rating. Florida is one of those 12. So notwithstanding all that's been happening economically, the fiscal discipline that's been happening has been good and strong. And again, I want to just say, always room for tremendous improvement, but compared to every other state being hit so tough, that's where we stand today. Credit needs to be given to former budget chairman, David Ibera, e. and our representative. They are the ones who made these tough decisions. In fact, just last week, Barron's Magazine identified Florida as one of the most fiscally disciplined states in the country. And stating specifically, it was the wisdom in how they balanced their budget, provided for reserves, and found their footing. Now, at the very same time, our, our country is going the completely the opposite direction. But one of the things that was important to us as a state is that years ago, the people went to the ballot box and they placed inside our state's constitution a balanced budget requirement. They mandated, our behavior was, you must balance the budget. You cannot leave town spending money you don't have or running up debt that can't be paid back. So that is real in this state. And that's allowed us to be such a high performer. Now here would be the problem of going the other direction. California is on the other direction. If California and Florida borrowed $7 billion, which is not unheard of,
for road construction, university construction, school construction. And both of us borrowed that same money for 15 years right now. The difference between our bond rating, our financial standing in the marketplace because of our discipline would be this. California would pay $1 billion more than Floridians would pay in interest expense for that money. That's what they've done. And every one of us knows that fiscal lack of discipline is a tax on all the people of California. And somehow they still parade around out there trying to convince the rest of us that somehow they are enlightened people for how they've operated. So let me just add a couple more things and I'd love to take some questions. People say to me, so how badly did the downgrade hurt Floridians? I say, it wasn't the downgrade. The downgrade finally only put in the paper what we've all known. The irresponsible behavior out of our Congress with poor policy making and no courage has caused our problem. Not the downgrade. So here's just a couple of other items. Taxes. In 1969, only 12% of the American people did not pay federal income taxes. And now you know what it is. Today, it's 44%. And every year, it gets worse. So who would have ever thought that among our founders, one of them would have ever imagined there would come a day in America where half of the population felt itself entitled to the sacrifice and the struggle of the other half. Wouldn't have ever happened. They could never have imagined this. But somehow, that's what our Congress believes this tax code makes sense. Not a chance. Next thing I'd say about, about spending. Just 1970, and I know that's not the dark ages. I look around this room, many of us in this room, in 1970 were wearing bell bottoms, all right? About to be introduced to leisure suits. In 1970, the federal government spent $9,300, uh, that was $9,300 in debt for every American. Now it's $40,000 in debt for every American. How could we possibly imagine that this is the right path for us to be going? Uh, next, let me just say, entitlements. Are we filming? <laughs> if yeah, I'll, I want to be sure I get this right, okay? Why in this country can't we have a civil conversation about existing entitlements without the name calling or the fear mongering that begins as soon as someone tries to say, some of these initiatives are not sustainable in their present form and will not be available to the next generation. So why would we think in some kind of comfort we can press onward knowing we may benefit from this but our children, our grandchildren won't? So here's this another statistic for you. In 1935, which I'm sure most of you know, that is when President Roosevelt signed Social Security. And again, in that bill was a specific retirement age of 65. In 1930, the lifespan of a male was 58 years old. <laughs> a female was 61. Now, for a male, 76, and a female, 81. So, at the very time we know that the next generation will be doing their best to find a job at this very moment, find any job, they are immediately paying into a system that they know will be bankrupt before they ever have a chance to benefit from it. Why can't we talk about that? Why can't we have a civil conversation that this is just not fair to the next generation? The debt is not fair. Programs that cannot stay funded are not fair. And that's in, in, in the tax system is not fair. So I'll finish on you know the tax system and just say this. People would say to me, you know, what's our answer? The answer is several of these matters. We can't keep spending money we don't have. Uh, it's, it's been egregious. It's been, uh, uh, frankly, been, been shameful what we have done. We can't keep borrowing the money and put that debt on our children. And, and lastly, though, it comes down to we are a pioneering people as Americans. We still have to be the place where people want to get up in the morning and go do something and accomplish something. 
be the best they can be, achieve something, leave a legacy, make a difference. The tax code that we have is everything but that. And I, and I would say to you this example, imagine a, 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 a two different electrical contractors, and I'll just use it this way, imagine two different electrical contractors. One makes a choice to work 30 hours a week, covers their needs, that's what they choose. The other, choose to work 70 hours a week. They want to provide for their family. They have children to go to school. They have aging parents. They have health needs that you and I are not familiar with. But that's their commitment. When did we become the country that would say to the person willing to sacrifice and commit themselves to hard work at 70 hours a week that we deserve more of your paycheck than the person who chose 30 hours? But that's who we've become. A tax code that America needs is one that puts in its basis the only thing that we should be taxing for is to fund a federal government that stays within the boundaries of what the Constitution established it to do and no more. It should not be a tax code for the purposes of redistributing wealth. And so that's the, kind of, uh, that's the kind of tax code that would allow us to turn loose the energy, the innovation, the creativity, and get working again. So I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and, and, and Marcus, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dan, I want to thank you for the invitation to be here with you all, everyone, tonight as well. Um, and uh, I'm ready to take some questions, if, that, if, some, if it's okay. Or is that all right? Absolutely. Okay, yes. fire away. I'm going to invoke executive privilege and okay. take the first one myself. Okay, sure, yeah. fire away. As far as, uh, of course, we live in Florida, and Florida is known as Hurricane Alley, of course. Right. Uh, and as a homeowner, and there are many homeowners here, one of the most concerning aspects, aside from our home values and everything else, is the state of our homeowner's insurance. And the frustration that many feel, because uh, as we feel conservatives, and we are holders of the free market, we're hoping that the state of Florida can somehow establish that, a fairer, freer market for insurance, so that so much of our money is not going down the sink, if you will, in premiums, and we can probably bring more competition that would allow us to be able to choose somebody other than citizens for which, shall we say, the reputation is not sterling, shall we say to put it mildly, and to be able to give the people more of a choice of insurance coverage so they can go ahead and model that or make that more attainable to their budget. Yeah, right. And this is a, uh, what Mark assured us, I know must be a, a tremendously important one for everybody here. Uh, at this point, when, when uh, our Office of Insurance Regulations provides the invitation for insurance companies to come and make their filing to do business here in the state of Florida, people look upon our particularly southeastern coast and our Panhandle coast, and to some extent, the southwest coast of Florida, and they have established rates that they place in a marketplace environment, that they place in, and uh, believing those to be the rates that if category, particular category storms would hit, those would be the kinds of premium that would allow them to be able to withstand and stay strong as a company and pay those claims. Presently, those rates have been far higher than citizens. And citizens has been there to try to offer this bridge of time until a, a a years would pass following 04, 05, just as time passed after Andrew, and that these companies would begin to say, maybe the experiences that we felt in 04, 05 were the anomaly, and we can come back in and begin to lower our rates, and, and, and families would want to be able to once again experience a free market system, that players were here, and they could begin to find a premium that was more suitable. Today, that's the situation we have, is that only but for citizens around this room today, there may be there be no option. There may be no alternative, and that's what it was designed as that that, that insurer of last resort. And so, as concerned as we are today about where our citizens' rates are, we're trying to find market players to come back to begin to absorb the housing stock in families and relationships, and once again offer product. Uh, we are seeing some of that taking place around 
uh, the rest of the state. Now, I would tell you an interesting fact, which is of no consolation to those of us who live along Southeast Florida, is that the most recent hurricane models that were done actually are now increasing rates in interior Florida faster than the rates that are occurring on the coast. And the argument there had been historically that these hurricanes never really caused interior damage. But after they looked at 0405, that's where the damage, most of the damage was, was in the Orlando, Winter Haven communities. And so they're now experiencing rate increases. So at the moment, uh, again, your, your, your legislature uh, has maintained a 10% cap, so rates cannot go up more than 10%. And these insurance companies are saying, we just can't come back at that number and offer our product. We feel we've been putting the people at risk that when the, when the hurricane came, we wouldn't have the capital to pay back all the necessary claims. So we're still in a bind and it's going to take us a few more years. That's where we're at at the moment. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is Marcus as well. And uh, I read a, an excellent policy brief from the James Madison Institute about the public employee retirement system. And they hi highlight a lot of problems that go along with it. You know, because of, uh, an example would be uh, the union system, whether it's the firefighter or the police, uh, putting a stranglehold on bargaining with the county and the cities and the state. And I was wondering if there's any uh, substantive gains to rectify the system because that's one way of bank pretty much bankrupting the, the state revenue stream as well. Yeah, it's a very good point. This is, uh, let me give you the, uh, those of us uh, here have a, uh, have a duty to you as state officers. And the, uh, there is a significant difference between the uh, state retirement and what is probably uh, uh, the more uh, frequent occurrences in counties and cities and school boards. Uh, in other words, uh, the, uh, the, the pension plan at the state level it has not reached as what you might consider uh, in a terminology, and again, not, not to be anything uh, uh, disrespectful, not as rich in its benefits as are what are occurring at the local levels. And, and so the legislature also funded every year on schedule what was necessary actuarially to stay sound. So with, this, with the plans as they were, the funding as it was, the state's plan is in good shape and is not a, a particular or significant burden on taxpayers. However, this past year, the legislature provided to the governor, uh, which uh, I think all of us in this room would probably agree to, that state employees should begin to participate towards that retirement. And so now there is a participation of state employees, uh, myself, all of us included, to contribute towards our and, and that is the appropriate thing to do. Again. Try to imagine a state, which I know that you're experiencing, over 10.5% unemployment. Many people with jobs have no pension plan. They may have a 401k, they may have nothing. And yet, a state employee who you're paying for was getting their full retirement paid for. So now that's changed, and that was done with Rick Scott. And I think he has um, additional measures he'll want to address in the coming legislative session. The far, far more 